All right. All right. Good evening, everybody. We will go ahead and get started uh, with tonight's city council meeting. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight uh, for this Tuesday, February 14th meeting of the city council. And happy Valentine's Day and uh, for spending some of your Valentine's Day with us. So thank you. Uh, will everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We're going to get to work here, although we have, we're going to be setting a, a bill to Dennis Thomas. There's a broken city council seat up here that we think is Dennis's, so. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, can we have roll call, please, Ms. O'Connell? Councilmember Clarici? Here. Councilmember Gottberg? Here. Councilmember, excuse me, Vice Mayor No? Here. Mayor Saragossa? Here. Councilmember Yarbrough? Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we don't have any ceremonial items tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, closed session report. Uh, there were th Thanks. New here. Um, there were three items in closed session. The first item, there was uh, no action taken at this time. The last two items, uh, staff was directed to bring back uh, an item for open session. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to item five, which is adoption of our agenda. I'll move to adopt the agenda. I'll second. Thank you. We have a first and a second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Council Member Yarbrough? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to. Uh, Did you introduce Elena or you want to? Oh. I sort of went over it, but. <laughs> <laughs> 630 is going to get here real fast. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I should mention <laughs> for, uh, filling in on that. She's part of our team, but uh, our city attorney, Ibrahim Mona, is not here tonight. Uh, Elena is filling in uh, from BBK. So thank you for coming. And I don't know if you want to say a thank few you. words. Thank you. From, uh, from Chronic Moscovitz, Elena Pacheco. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I said BBK. <laughs> See? Cleve threw me off. No. All right. Thank you for being here this evening. All right, so we'll move ahead uh, to item six and item 6.1, uh, which are brief comments by the city council. And I'll start with council member Garbro. No comments at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. Um, I attended the El Dorado County Tourism Summit. I walked Main Street with John doing uh, surveys for a trip to Green with the merchants. I toured the Navigation Center and I uh, attended the LAFCO City Collection, uh, Selection Committee. So those are little extras that I've been doing. Great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Clarici. I did everything she did except the first thing. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Council Member Gobberg. Um I met with our California District's four Senator, Marie Alvarado-Gill, and I also met with the Director of New Morning Youth and Family Services. Great. That's awesome. And so is she going to be our best friend in the city of Placerville, our new state senator? I sure hope so. I, I hope. think it's a good relationship that we're building, and she's uh, been up here quite a bit. So That's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, for myself, uh, I also attended the uh, opening of the new Navigation Center. Um, just a few words on that. I'm, I'm really excited to see that up and off the ground. Uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, Caltrans, along with CHP and the city, our police department, uh, there will be, uh, we will be, the encampment up on Upper Broadway will be getting closed down as we transition folks over to the Navigation Center. So it's been a long time, and it's been, I know, a lot of frustration throughout the city, but uh, we're going to be accomplishing a couple of things, really closing down the biggest in in housing encampment in the city of Placerville, and at the same time getting uh, folks that choose to go into the Navigation Center a chance to hopefully get on the right path. So we're excited for that development. Um, like I said, it's, I'm sure it took longer than we wanted it to, but at the end of the day, uh, the other good part of that is Caltrans is going to be doing a lot of the um, 
work and the cleanup to that area. So there's going to be a lot less of a cost to the city and the taxpayers uh, in the city of Placerville as well. So kudos to everybody, to Cleve and to the chief and to our counterparts at the county uh, for getting this moving along. So we'll see. It's Again, it's not a um, – this isn't going to solve homelessness in El Dorado County. Uh, it's not going to solve homelessness in Placerville but it is a step in the right direction and it'll give us a chance also to enforce our no, oh no camping rules in the city of, as well as we move forward. So again, not a panacea, but certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, so with that, um, we will go ahead and, oh, actually I did want to, uh, if y'all bear with me, uh, Rebecca, I just wanted to see if you could give us a 30 second update on our, a couple of our sinkholes around the city. What sinkholes? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> on Spring Street, they're making really good progress. Uh, we do find daily surprises, um, which is always fun. Um, but luckily, we have a really good crew out there, and they know how to fix what needs to be fixed for longevity's sake. And um, we are looking at probably concluding work uh, next Friday, the 24th. Um, might be a little sooner than that, but I'd rather overshoot a little bit. They started uh, doing the form work for the ADA ramps at the intersection, and they are getting on the schedule for paving uh, temperature dependent. And then the work on the other sinkhole on Placerville Drive is on the schedule in about four to five weeks, I believe. But um, before that, we will actually start to see, um, you may have noticed some work going on actually at Placerville Station, which is the park and ride lot that's um, located at Mosquito Road and Clay Street area. So that work's going to be going on. So a few little areas of construction in town. Okay, great. Thank you, Rebecca. Sure. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, we will move on to the uh, consent calendar. Uh, all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion by roll call vote unless any member of the council wishes to remove an item for discussion. And I will go ahead and open up uh, the consent calendar for any public comments. Good evening. Good evening. Ryan Carter. Uh, can I get a little bit of clarity on 7.5, the um, street frontage improvement agreement? I was reading the staff's report and uh, that there are over 400 of these that have been uh, issued and um, uh, I guess I forget the word, but the, the county, they're, they're filed with the county. So if I get some um, clarity on what these are and what the city, uh, how, the, how we benefit in the future possibly from these, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the consent calendar? Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comment, uh, bring it back. Um, I don't know. Uh, Rebecca, have you had any comments on uh, on that item on 7.5? Sure. Um, this is actually a pretty standard item. I think probably one comes before city council every month or every other month. Um, but our city code does require the installation of frontage improvements upon receipt of uh, certain permit processes, specifically building permit issuance when it's over 200 square feet uh, or 400 square feet for a dwelling unit. So when those changes occur, a permit is pulled, um, they can either do curb gutter and sidewalk at that time, but oftentimes they're running pretty thin on their budget already because it's usually private homeowners that are doing these um, improvements for single family homes or, or ADUs. And so what we will do is this is a variance to that immediate need. And uh, the code allows us to issue the variance in the form of an agreement, and that agreement cites out the limits and approximate size of the street frontage improvements that would be required to satisfy that condition. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Cleve, you want to add a little yeah, bit just more Just quickly add, and, and we can call those in with 90 days notice. Is that correct, Rebecca? Correct. And actually, thank you for bringing that up. The other thing is, in the past, uh, on the occasion, we have called them in, um, specifically when it's within a particular project limits. Understood. And that was, um, was it on Broadway the last time we, we did that? Yes. Yeah. 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 We called it in and we worked with the property owner um, and we were actually able, they donated the right of way um, and we were actually able to work with them. We, we try not to hurt anybody when we're doing these, but we do need to have these improvements around for the overall safety and quality of life of our own community. 
but we do work with property owners and trying to help where we can if there is a project that's within vicinity we typically work with the property owner so that they it's a shared cost approach um, you know and, re, and we just completed the right of way with um, with that property on Broadway where they donated the land over and they've been really great working with us on this and waived compensation uh, on purchasing of right of way on their half and we in turn are helping cover some of the construction costs so thank you sir could, could you describe for the public what a street frontage improvement might entail sure um, typically it's curb gutter and sidewalk for the length of the frontage of the parcel that has the improvements thank you sure thank you yes I I will be having a, a very personal point on this as I was you know I thought Caltrans might eventually get around to highway 49 but I, I got to fix it, the uh, uh, sidewalk in front of my place so we should You'll probably all... talk they are looking at a project okay well we should talk then. <laughs> all right okay um, with that then uh, we brought it back can I will uh, entertain a motion on the consent calendar I'll move the consent calendar thank you I'll second Okay, we have a first and a second. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. All right, consent calendar passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca, for the uh, extra information on 7.5. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to public comment uh, for non-agendized items. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any matter not on the agenda, and that is within the subject matter of the jurisdiction of the city council. Uh, the mayor reserves the right to limit the speaker's time to three minutes. Uh, you are not allowed to make personal attacks on individuals or make comments which are slanderous or which may invade an individual's personal privacy. Uh, and we will go ahead and start with uh, oral communications. So come on up. Guess I'll start. Um, for those of you that don't know, I am a, a peace officer in the state of California, and I went to work on uh, Sunday morning uh, thinking it would be just another day, um, and it was not. Uh, one of my partners, one of my brothers in arms, uh, took his life over the weekend. And... Um, in the course of my 20 plus year career um, in law enforcement, this has happened dozens of times. Um, suicide is, it's, it's exploding in our society right now. Um, and I really just want people to be cognizant of their family, their friends, especially their children, uh, their partners, and um, look for warning signs and uh, just try and be there. Um, there's a family, a father, a mother, siblings that are uh, destroyed, uh, a work family that's distraught. And uh, anyway, just suicide awareness is something that all of us really need to be cognizant of. And, you know, uh, fire, police, and um, military, uh, the, the numbers are, are higher for all those professions. So really just be cognizant of your first responders. Uh, let them know that they're doing a great job. Um, and because uh, they see and do things every day that are horrific and a lot of us are not good at um, at uh, processing and talking about those things and that's why I think our suicide rate is higher than the general public um, in general so anyway thank you um, and good night well, thank you for your comments and uh, sorry for your loss Hi, my name is Jane McGinnis. Um, I've been out of circulation for a couple of months, and there's a, almost a whole new council. Uh, this is fantastic. Hi, yes. Um, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to just thank the city um, for all of your efforts in providing a safe space this winter. Uh, you reached out and really helped a lot of people. Uh, and also for helping to create this new shelter and navigation center. It's been an amazing three years. It's been, I don't know if you can believe this or not, Michael, it's been three years since I came in here and, and addressed you for the first time. Um, there is a feeling of celebration among everybody involved, all the advocates, people in the city, um, staff, and the homeless. Um, and I think with the completion of this first 
new shelter, uh, we have probably floated the heaviest boat that there is to float. So with everybody working together, it should be an easier lift to go on to the next thing. EDOC has done a wonderful job. They've put together an excellent plan that's got 1,750 moving parts. So there's plenty of things to do over the next few years. Um, and I know I sound like a broken record, but I need to say I feel the need to remind everybody the last point in time count was 619 homeless. We have 60 beds. We didn't used to have any. We have 60 beds. It's a huge win. Uh, I am so thrilled and grateful to all of you. But when those beds are full, we still have Martin Boise to think about. We have to be careful not to go running forward and saying, okay, we get to clear all the camps, move everybody off the land, because we only have 60 beds. And that law is still out there. So the most important thing I wanted to share is as we move on to whatever the next step is going to be in assisting the unhoused, may all of our thoughts and all of our actions to protect our homeless neighbors be for the glorifying of our Lord and not for ourselves. Thank you all so much for what you've done. You've become friends over the last three years, and I thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Right, the I know. That we're all giggling up it's, 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 it's snowing it's outside. outside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's snowing in Tahoe, Tahoe right. too. <laughs> Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. Um, I have to agree with your first speaker here. It is wonderful to see that navigation center open. I was a little. I felt a little bit um, sad when I saw the the uh, Boy Scout cabin with no lights on this last week because they were they, because you had the navigation center open. And I wonder if for those other 580 people, if maybe we could do something for them too and keep that keep that going. But my main comment tonight is about the bollards on Main Street. I wonder why we did those, but I think they were supposed to help us see the see pedestrians. Um, they really don't are not effective. There's two new ones that are so much give out some of so much more light, and by those you actually can see if there's someone going into the crosswalk. So if we could replace our old ones with those new brighter ones, that would be a big step in the right direction because those old ones look like they're there for decoration and nothing else. The light they give out is no more. You could light a match and do better. So thanks, Cleve, for the two new ones, and probably Rebecca too. <laughs> nope. <laughs> but those are, those are a big improvement. I think we should replace all those old ones with the newer ones that have more light. Thank you, Sue. Hello, Ruth Michelson, merchant on Main Street. What I wanted to talk today about, and you, don't, you guys don't have a clock, right? So you'll just flag me. Is it there? It's up oh, on top. Okay, up there. Okay, good. Um, I want to talk about the tree lighting. You call it Festival of Lights. I refuse to call it Festival of Lights. That's the name for Hanukkah, and I'm Jewish. So I'll call it tree lighting. Um, so I think you're all aware that there was a letter from the, um, what was that letter from? The, uh, that official organization that wants to make sure things are, Terry, can you help me? What was the letter from? The ACLU. Civil, Liber Civil Liberties Union. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, about the what the tree lighting was the past two years. If you're not familiar with the th two or three page letter from the ACLU that was written to the city, it was a type of letter of warning that said, this is, you are focusing too much on one religion, this is too religious, and you are on city property. Um, I'm paraphrasing, I'd be glad to supply you with a letter. Um, I didn't inspire the letter to be written 
I don't get credit for it, but I did see the letter. And um, it said that if you're going to do something on city property, you have to be more all-inclusive for other faiths. You cannot just represent the Christian faith. And um, I know there are those who thought that it was toned down this year, but I ask you to please listen to the songs that were sung. They were hymnals that were Christian. And I also want to say that um, the people of the Jewish faith, faith asked if they could be included to, to two different people in two different ways, both city officials, not going to name names right now, embarrassing, but we're told no. No, that's not quite right. One was a city official, and one was the person who put on the event, Al Soto. We asked Al Soto, could we have three minutes to light the menorah and say the blessing? And he said, no. We have very tight um, programming between four and six, and we can't light the tree late. And so, no, you may not have three minutes. So that's not what I would call inclusive. And, act, and then I would also like to say, and I know each merchant has their own opinion about this, but I thought it was just totally a blowout Disneyland type of an event with those raised screens and everything else. We are a small town, historic Placerville, and I just don't think we should be doing events for our people, not something that's drawing in thousands more from outside. And so I think we need to tone it down. So seven seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. All right. Any other public comments? All right. Seeing none, uh, I will go ahead and close public comments. Thank you, everybody. Regina, did we have any written comments tonight? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will now. Uh, we don't have any items uh, pulled from consent. No ordinance or public hearings this evening. Uh, so we will move to item 12, uh, discussion and action items, and item 12.1, uh, which is review the results of the recent survey of downtown merchants about the farmer's markets uh, held on Wednesday afternoons at the Bell Tower, and two, provide direction to staff for the continued use of the Bell Tower area uh, for the farmer's market. And Mr. Zeller has this report for us. Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, I would just like to quickly mention that um, we did receive um, a survey comment about a week after the deadline from Old Town Grill. Um, that um, comment has been provided to the City Council as of today, and copies of those comments are on the back table as well as on the City's website. And um, because it was late, it is not part of the summary, Attachment B. Understood. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, staff is looking for some direction on um, whether or not to continue uh, to allow the use of the Bell Tower area for a farmer's market by the El Dorado County Farm Trails. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Uh, in 2014, the city entered into an agreement with El Dorado County Farm Trails uh, to formalize an existing farmer's market that had been going on at the Bell Tower. Uh, this agreement uh, has been renewed over the years uh, without changes, and it offers the lease of the Bell Tower area each Wednesday afternoon um, from the first Wednesday in June to the last Wednesday in October. Um, and just for a little context, in 2020, uh, there were three farmers markets operating on city property. Uh, there was the Saturday market on the El Dorado Trail that was just north of the Ivy lot. There was also a Sunday market at the Tetralt lot by the post office and this Wednesday farmer's market at the Bell Tower. Uh, in 2021, um, my department did uh, make an effort to consolidate the vendors of the three markets on city property to a two market arrangement. Um, and that would have been one at the Fox lot for the Wednesday afternoons and the Elder, other um, at the El Dorado Trail north of the Ivy lot for the Saturday mornings. And the, the goal really behind that was um, to try to increase the number of vendors within a given farmer's market to create um, a little bit more um, critical mass for each one of the markets and also limiting the locations to reduce conflict between the markets and downtown merchants for parking and also for competition. Uh, we did put together an RFP that was proposed at the February 9th, 2021 City Council meeting, uh, but the Council did decide to postpone that RFP and allow the existing three markets with agreements uh, in place to continue 
uh, to operate on their locations of public property with the same um, situation that they had been previously. Um, and then in 2021, um, also the Saturday and the Sunday farmers markets both moved uh, to the Regal Cinema parking lot. So that left the Wednesday bell, bell tower market as the only remaining farmer's market on city property. Um, and also um, uh, in the fall of 2021, we did continue to get concerns voiced by downtown merchants, uh, which prompted a discussion about the possibility of 2022 being the last year for the Wednesday market uh, at the bell tower. Uh, we began working with Eldorado County Farm Trails in the fall of 2022 to plan uh, a move um, to the Eldorado tra Trail between Clay and Locust Streets, just north of the Ivy Lot. That was the preferred location. Um, so um, in January, uh, we did have a sit-down meeting with uh, Eldorado County Farm Trails. Um, uh, they requested a meeting with us, uh, and so it was the city manager, myself, and a representative of Eldorado County Farm Trails to discuss the pop possibility of remaining at the tower location in 2023 and beyond. Um, some of the um, reasons for uh, their in continued interest in that location is that um, the presence of the market downtown they felt was very uh, positive and also the economic di difficulty of reestablishing a market in a different location. Um, so as a result of that meeting, um, I created a three-question survey and hand-delivered it to merchants on Main Street between Bedford and Sacramento Streets to gauge the impact of the market on the businesses and the downtown as a whole. And so the questionnaire is an attachment, uh, the attachment A to the staff report. Um, there's also a survey summary, which is uh, right behind that, attachment B, which uh, basically lists out the questions on the survey and shows a uh, percentage of responses for each one of those. And the summary had basically whether it helped or hurt um, the local uh, businesses in the downtown and if, if individual merchants appreciated it not or they were neutral. And so they had a, the ability to answer in the affirmative, negative, or neutral. And um, I can go over that um, survey summary uh, once we wrap up staff report. Um, and I also have uh, copies of any and all of the uh, survey results that came back with any written comments on them for the, for the um, purpose of getting a better idea of what people really are thinking about it. And um, once they put some pen, pen to paper to make sure that those entered the record. So um, staff, staff is requesting uh, that the council review the survey summary, uh, have a discussion, and move to approve one of the five options below. Um, it is worth noting that um, if the option to move the market to the trail location is, is chosen, it may require some improvements to the ground surface uh, where booths will be located to meet county health department standards. Um, Moving the market to the Main Street frontage of the Ivy Lot is also possible with consideration of keeping uh, the lease spaces that we have out there and a driving lane open through the lot during markets uh, operating hours. And then keeping the market at the Bell Tower will continue to cost the city labor to set up and fill water barricades. It is worth noting that the Eldorado County uh, farm, farm trails do uh, empty the barricades and to put them back. So it is a cooperative effort on making sure that we create that vehicular separation. So all the options have their costs, which are outlined below. So based on the survey results, uh, staff is requesting the council to consider one of the five options, either leave the market at the bell tower with no changes to its program or footprint, leave it at the bell tower uh, with conditions such as removing Stagecoach Alley from the market footprint, uh, shrinking it a bit, uh, moving the market to the trail behind the Ivy Lot between Clay and Locust Streets, uh, moving the market to the south portion of the Ivy Lot, or other options as the council sees fit. Uh, some of the costs uh, that would be incurred with each one of these, uh, we're looking at improvements for the um, the trail location, which would be estimated around less than $500, which could be absorbed through the general fund. Um, moving the market to the Ivy, Ivy Lot would would require some minor pothole filling and both the trail and the Ivy Lot locations would need the installation of a power outlet for any entertainment 
Keeping the market at the bell tower has its own cost. Uh, we calculated that um, average cost per week for setting and filling the barricades for our staff is around $332, uh, three maintenance workers, two hours apiece, plus a minimal cost for the water is calculated. Uh, so once again, staff asked that we review the results of the downtown merchant survey and give us direction on how to proceed. And I can take any questions, and I believe representatives of El Dorado County Farm Trails are here also. All right. Thank you, Terry. Uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Zeller at this point from council? Um, I don't know. I can go to public comment if... I'll just ask one question. Obviously, yep. I could do the math on this, but um, what is the total annual cost for the Bell Tower location? Um, I believe we have a five-month window, um, and if you consider four and sometimes five uh, Wednesdays, um, I can do the math if you want me to whip out my calculator. $7,175.07. $7 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very perfect there. I didn't, I didn't um, I have a mathematician. And then a second question uh, related to the Ivy lot. Would that location, if there was a lane still open for traffic and the lease parking also requires some sort of barricading to for safety reasons, if we're going to um, leave the parking lot half open? Uh, we would provide barricades, but I don't believe we would need water barricades because it's a parking lot versus a um, uh, roadway. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, Councilmember Yarbrough. Okay, so in regards to the Ivy Lot, um, where the Saturday market used to be, correct? That's correct. Okay, and wasn't there a, a same issue with uh, complaints and having them move, and that's why they ended up on the trail? Um, the biggest complaint with the Saturday Farmer's Market was that it was in direct competition for parking locations for the businesses that surrounded the Ivy Lot on Saturdays. On Wednesdays, there's going to be a lot less um, need for that parking Saturday af or Wednesday afternoons uh, for the businesses. It was mostly the Im impact from the restaurants. Okay. Okay. Any other questions at this point? All right. Seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and. Oh, yep. Go ahead, John. This is a this. The current contract is a fixed cost contract. So the 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 the, the organizer of the farmers market pays a single fee to the city per what per unit month week whatever month per month. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and open up item 12.1 for public comment. Hello, I'm Mike Owen, uh, president Good. of Farm Trails, and I appreciate uh, being able to address this august body on, during this snowstorm. <laughs> um, so Farm Trails is, has sponsored this or, uh, farmer's market for quite a while. And uh, to be honest, we were a little dismayed to hear uh, there was a planned move. Uh, we knew that the previous moves into that parking lot uh, behind or into the, the area behind the parking lot had led to the failure of a market. We invested uh, a good amount um, of time and effort. And I think uh, Shauna, it was uh, our farmer's market manager, she said it's five to six years to be able to move a market and have it reestablish itself. And so there's some impacts that are pretty positive I wanted to bring up. Um, and at the same time, I also wanted to recognize that it, it's, a, it's a pain and there's you know, a swarm of people. It doesn't impact retail very positively always, but it brings people downtown and it marks uh, the area. It marks Placerville as a place where something's happening on Wednesdays. Um, one of the things that happened uh, during COVID was the uh, CalFresh program, which is a uh, uh, out there to address the underserved um, allowed two times the amount of the face value of the CalFresh at a farmer's market. And this is a really unique way for people to not only <clears throat> keep monetize their little farms, but also folks who are um, not able to, uh, to purchase things at Safeway um, or at uh, retail would have twice the bar or twice the purchasing power. <clears throat> so we really think that it's a community uh, advocacy thing that we're doing. It helps small farms, brings people downtown, 
Um, we are very pleased to see, and I really appreciate the city sitting down, talking to us, and then uh, doing this survey because I really think um, I, I don't know what the percentage of responses were out of which what uh, Terry distributed, um, but the <clears throat> it seemed like the overwhelming amount of folks were had good things to say uh, about the market, and I would uh, encourage uh, the city to keep it. Um, just please, so you know, I don't have any personal stake in the market. I'm not a uh, farmer. And I don't um, sell anything at the market. So this is purely something that, that we do to support farm trails, which does scholarships. And uh, you know, we just are donating money for farm days. And, and it's all about ag, guys. And so this is a way that the city can participate in ag in an indirect way. And thank you very much for letting me to speak. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I will mention that uh, the survey went out initially to 75 merchant businesses. I think that I found a few more that I needed to uh, get out there. So I think it was total of around 80. And I think we got 33 of them back. Or no, Thank you. sorry, 20, 23. 23. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Good evening. Ruth Carter, City of Placerville. And I just wanted to speak to um, one of the options was shrinking the footprint for the farmer's market. Um, we just in staff council's um, uh, comments, they were talking about, you know, one of the positives was being able to bring more people into the market. If you shrink the footprint, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, I'm for leaving it where it's at. I think it's nothing but a positive on our community for all the reasons that Mike mentioned. And, um, you know, shrinking the footprint would only handicap the market further. Um, maybe there's a compromise in there. Maybe um, when we're setting up for the market, we could have some volunteers that would also fill the barricades to alleviate some of the cost. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. And I take the absolute opposite approach. When they have the Wednesday farmer's market, I just avoid going downtown. As soon as I realize, oh, no, it's Wednesday market, I turn around and go home, no matter what I was going to do downtown, whether it was to pick up prescriptions or go to Placerville Hardware or anywhere else. I just say, you know, it has become, a, I think it's a safety issue. They're so far out in the street that it's difficult to drive and people are walking around the barricades. People don't stay on the other side of the barricades. They go around the barricades. So you've got people out in the traffic lane. You've got people everywhere. There is no parking left in the garage. There is nothing on Stagecoach Alley except vendors. And they're not all farmers vendors either. If it was all farmers, I think it would be better but it's not. It's everything from ribbons and bows to uh, um, crafts and arts and a few vegetables and fruits, but a lot of it is not vegetables and fruits anymore. I was really happy when the city said that 2022 was going to be the last year, and I said, oh, good. I can go downtown on Wednesdays now. And so to have you bring this up again, I think it's not a good place. It's not a great place in the city to have this. The bell tower itself makes it so you have to be very watchful when you're driving. That corner from people coming around to come back into the street, turning either left or right, you're always watching out for the traffic. You're watching out for the people on the crosswalks there. And to have the farmer's market in addition to that with all the people walking around the barricades and on the outsides, uh, I think it's a hazard. And I would like to see 2022 to be the last year for the farmer's market at the Bell Tower. Um, this El Dorado Trail location where we moved the original farmer's market was not a success. I got to agree there. It was, it was not a good place for a farmer's market. But the Ivy House lot succeeded for years and years and years. And I think that would be appropriate. And with it being on a Wednesday where there's not as much uh, restaurant traffic and stuff for downtown, that would be a good place. If they want to have a Wednesday market, I would vote for 
taking it to the Ivy House lot. Thank you, Sue. Okay. Good evening. Let's see. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm Albert Fausel from Placerville Hardware. I'm also a rancher around town, part of the the farm trails. Um, downtown, I've seen the market for quite a while now, and uh, it has affected my business. I, it's the parking issue. It's my big trucks coming in, my freight truck during the middle of a farmer's market. Um, it's my restroom. There's not a lot of restrooms downtown, so that kind of gets taken advantage of a little bit. Uh, but I mean, we do need our farmers markets. I totally support farmers. I'm a farmer. Um, we need these markets. It's just where it's at. It, 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 it can hurt me. I can have people drive by if I don't have an open spot. I've been down there. I've told the market that I need some of these 20 minute zones moving, but it seems like I have a lot from two o'clock to five o'clock. There's a lot of unloading, a lot of moving going on, but it, it, it doesn't seem to really help my business as much as I'd like, but uh, I mean, I do support the farmers, that's all I can say, but uh, it has affected me, so that's where I'll, I'll leave it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hello, Ruth Michelson. Um, I'm wondering about just taking off some of like what Sue Rodman said about um, could there be a compromise in that we really focus on the fruits and the vegetables? And, you know, there's some things at the farmer's market that compete with businesses downtown. Um, we do have a florist, so we're selling flowers and some other um, rocks and gems. We've got several stores downtown that do that. And so maybe, uh, and we have a uh, store that sells olive oil as well, and there's usually an olive oil vendor there. So maybe we could focus on a, s a smaller footprint. Um, and I was thinking e even smaller than what I think uh, Mr. Zeller has mentioned, but one that was more like the shape of like a check mark where the small, the short side of the check would be in front of sourdough and the long part of the check would be um, the diagonal where there's that, where the just not in front of Angie's pop art, you know. What if that, if you follow what I'm saying, it's not a full triangle and also not the quartz alley. I mean, it'd be a much smaller market, but focused on fruits and vegetables. I like that we have the community, the sense of community. I, I, I be, as a merchant, I like it that people come. Um, I hear what my co-merchants are saying about how it affects their businesses. So that's why I'm just wondering, um, if we didn't have it um, in front of uh, where the bicycle shop is and pop art, is, you know, I haven't figured it out. I didn't think it through beforehand, but if that could still people possibly park there or not, or maybe that's too conflicting with pedestrians. But um, I know that part of the problem with some of those businesses is once you start blocking the frontage or seeing the frontage, the visual of seeing the frontage, then for whatever reason, I don't quite follow the psychology that people don't go into those stores anymore. And I, I read the comments that everyone submitted, and, and I know that it impacts those businesses. I'm far enough down the street that um, it's not a negative impact on me. No one has ever said for my business that they can't park. Uh, I still have people come into the shop. Um, and again, I like that it's that community. Um, I think it's a positive, and I'd like to see if we couldn't have a solution that could um, help out the merchants that are impacted in a negative way. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Good evening, and a happy Valentine's Day. Um, happy Dennis Valentine's Tom Day. Yes, thank you. Dennis Thomas, I own Robinson's Pharmacy, and I'm told these three minutes go really fast, so I'm going to get to it here. Uh, I've been uh, very supportive or at least re maintain a neutral stance in most all events that go on downtown and the ones that that, that, that have um, caused street closures. And I believe it's important for community and I believe it's important for us to support other merchants. Um, those street closures that have been the events that occur once a year 
you know, we can, we can deal with. We can, it's reasonable. I can notify my customers. We can create an environment where maybe they can come back the next day. Um, those that happen, uh, on a weekly basis, every week on Wednesday, it's more challenging for my customers. I have a responsibility to those in our community, those in the community that Robinson's Pharmacy serves, and they should have a reasonable expectation of access to their health care. Uh, this health care includes timely access to their medications, post-physician visits, post-hospital visits, uh, emergency room visits. Um, you see, when a patient is diagnosed and determined that they uh, that they need an antibiotic, a medication, something for anxiety, you, you pick the pick the medic, you pick the disease. I'll give you a medication for it that they might need. Um, their choices should be available to pick up their medication. We are also a primary provider for medications to hospice patients, and they often have immediate needs for, for medications. And we do that on a daily basis, not weekly, but often many times a day. Um, there should be reasonable access to medication. That's not the case during the farmer's market. Years ago when the farmer's market started, and yes, I was there when it started. I was supportive of it. It was a small triangle that still allowed traffic to flow. Um, then it morphed into closing the alley, and then it morphed into filling the alley. It has um, project creep, mission creep. You, you pick it. It's, it has crept, and it's gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, this has an equal and detrimental impact to the businesses, and often the vendors are filling um, most of the most a lot of spaces on the lower level of the parking lot instead of moving off site where customers could park so the handicap spots are full the parking lower parking lots full and there's no upfront access in the alley now i don't blame the farmer's market for wanting to grow for wanting to expand to for wanting to be successful most established businesses in the media uh proximity though have grown weary of this event Here's what I want you to get from my comments. I don't think the city would block reasonable access to the hospital. Why would you block reasonable access to a pharmacy, a place that people go immediately after visiting the doctor, after visiting the hospital, after being released from the hospital to go home? Um, here's an interesting fact. One of the top reasons for readmission to a hospital is people not having access to their medication upon release. I urge you to consider moving the market to a location that they can grow and provide more service with less impact. And just, just to be, you know, I spend several thousand dollars a year on parking for my employees to park to make parking available for my customers. And on a weekly basis, when that's needed and it's not available, and people who are competing with other businesses downtown are parking in those spaces, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a concern. I, I went over my time, didn't I? Sorry, I got the red light. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Dennis. Good evening, Ryan Carter. Um, as a customer of the farmer's market, I was thrilled to see that the uh, downtown businesses responded so positively to this uh, um, survey. 74% uh, were in favor of it. Um, 70% uh, it says it said that it helped downtown overall. Um, to me, it's a no-brainer. Um, the downtown merchants overwhelmingly appreciate this farmer's market. Uh, Farm Trails has been successful where they are. Um, as a customer, I love it. I'm there every week. Um, to me, uh, if the parking's full, it's success. That means there's people downtown shopping, spending money. Uh, that's the goal of any um, event downtown is to bring people to spend money, right? Um, so I'm thrilled that the, the merchants are in favor of this. I'm thrilled that Farm Trails is willing to make it uh, to keep it going. And uh, I'm thrilled that hopefully you guys will keep it in its current location and uh, let this success uh, continue. Um, the parking is going to be an issue at uh, the other location also. Um, I mean, it's just... I think it's a marker of the success of the market. You know, that many people are down there. The parking's full. Um, anyway, just keep it going. It's great. 
Uh, the residents love it. The businesses, obviously, by a huge uh, majority, love it. I understand some of the merchants um, are weary of it, and I just think that as a as a whole, we need to consider that the 75% of businesses that appreciate it, uh, even though there may be not here tonight, they did respond to the survey, and they said that they wanted it to stay. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, any further comments? Good evening. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Sean Hartzell. I am the market manager for the market. Um, a long time ago, <laughs> I was asked, or Farm Trolls was asked by the city of Placerville to start a market downtown. We worked with the market. Uh, Gary Pig was here at the time. Uh, we worked with him. He talked about what he wanted. Um, we started out small. I think we had four vendors. Um, Farm Trolls went into debt over trying to start this market. When we started it, the what they wanted, or what I was told was, they wanted a market that encompassed the bell tower, and then would and then would flow down the alley with vendors and lovely festive fare. Um, the market started out very small. For years, we went to build it. Um, we've always had to cut access down the alley um, for safety issues. We've had lots of pe times when people, people who do visit the pharmacy tend to be, um, they, if they come in to park and the, the alley was closed, it's a one way, they can't get out. So then they would try to leave through the market, and it was a very it was dangerous. And so as the market got bigger, we were able to we went into the alley and we closed it for safety, because it's no good to have people driving through markets. We watch that on the news all the time. Um, to change the footprint of the market would be hard, but we could. Um, moving you know moving the market would take another would take about five or six years to establish. It back to what it was. Um, during COVID, the market was able to provide. We were the only thing that was open. Um, we got to provide people with fresh fruits and vegetables. We were essential. Uh, this year, our the CalFresh program that we do, we've been approved to um, for eight thousand dollars, which means that we will be providing local people with twelve. Uh, $12,000 worth of fruits and vegetables for free or using their CalFresh. Um, we'll be providing that service to the people. So there's a lot of good things that it does. I know that it does impact traffic. I have been there many times directing traffic when Albert's trucks come so that they can unload. And I'm out there going, come this way, come this way, you know, doing, trying to do my best because I do understand that it impacts the, the, the businesses around us. And we... We tried to do our best to not do that because we want to be friends with everyone around us. And the fact that they don't like us, it's sad. So, but um, you know, we're we're there for four hours uh, once a month, or you know, every week. It does take us a long time to get the cars out of there. <laughs> that's our that's our biggest problem is the people that park there is trying to get them to move. So, okay. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Angie from Pop Art. Thank you all for what you do. Shauna, you know I like you. I've built so many relationships with so many of those wonderful vendors, whether they grow vegetables or make jewelry. Personally, I have great relationships, and you know we like you. We all like you. It's nothing to do with that, okay? I think it's pretty clear how I feel about how it impacts my business. I've already been here two years ago talking about that. But it's, it's safety now. This area is too active. We have so much going on there. Um, you know, I, uh, have, I have Wednesday truck delivery, um, and I was able to rearrange my delivery so that my drivers were able to get in and out of there safely. But anyway... I don't think I need to say any more about it that it's just that area is too active and it's unsafe and somebody's going to end up getting hurt. And that's all. Thank you. 
Thank you for the comments. Any other comments on this item? All right, going once, going twice, sold. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comments, bring it back to the council for further discussion. Uh, before we get into discussion, was there, I don't know if there's anything else staff wanted to make comments on from the comments. I didn't, wasn't sure, but um, just yes, check. Mr. Mayor, uh, I did want to mention that there is, in the, in the agreement, there is um, a section on talking about non-agricultural items and it is allowed, um, and that extent um, that it is allowed is uh, this, the city reserves the right to approve the items and the number of the vendors, and we do discuss that um, every year when they get started. Uh, that's, that's all the comments I have for right now. All right, thank you, Terry. Uh, yes. I have Mr. a question Parisi. about that specific issue, because I remember back uh, when I did this once before, if I remember correctly, when we were talking about the farmer's market at at the Ivy parking lot, that there was a percentage that was stated, I, I, may, I may be wrong and someone can correct me. In their contract, if I recall, there was a percentage that it had to be X amount farmers stuff and then other things, whatever those other things were. Is that the case here? Or is this like, I think I heard you say you kind of negotiate it year to year? That's correct. Um, yeah, the language basically allows the city to have a discussion with Farm Trails yeah. about the extent of non-agricultural items. Okay. Because yeah, I'm curious why that was not included, or if it wasn't, or maybe it was never in the other one, and I just made that up. I have. I just want to comment. I have seen that, John. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, Councilmember Krejci. It's okay. It, <laughs> um, but yeah, Terry's correct. I believe the current one does not have that. I've seen it in language in others. And I'm not sure if when we had the others up at Ivy House, if they had that language in there. It seems like perhaps they may have, um, but I, uh, this one currently is Yeah, I believe the, uh, the only time that language was ever um, addressed on that was when we did our RFP in 2021. And I think we had a, a percentage, I think it was not more than 20% for the RFP, but the actual agreements that I had with, um, with the Saturday and the Sunday Farmer's Market didn't spell it out either. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Anyone want to go first, sir? Yes, yes sir. Mr. Yarbrough. Uh, Terry, I think this might fall underneath you, so, um, and I know it doesn't happen as often as it used to, but how often uh, does the stagecoach run downtown? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, it, well, I just, I'm just referencing it to closing down the alley multiple times during the season. I mean, because we obviously do it for that. Right. I believe that's only um, during the Christmas holiday, and I think that's only on a, on a Saturday for three or four weeks in a row. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the horse has gotten tend to remember it being more year-round, like, but varying. Yeah, I'm not exactly... Right. Yep. Okay. That's a good question. All right. Anyone Who's want to start here? Off, yep. Start. Go. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> well, it's not an easy item. There's a, a lot of positives and negatives on all, all fronts. I think I just want to point out some of those, highlight those. Um, you know, someone made the comment that, you know, the parking garage is full and, and that's a good thing. I want to point out that that parking garage was paid for mostly by the building owners where those businesses are. So when we fill that garage with business for people who aren't paying rents for city front property, it doesn't really seem like fair competition. Um, we need to figure out a way to be fair to the merchants. Um, we rocked that place next to the trail to have a space for public events. I think we spent $10,000 doing that, Cleve. Um, you know, I just want to point out that, that we did try to make a space to have public events and, and to have venues like this. The cost to the city, it's $7,000 for the season, is pretty significant to me. You know, I feel like if we're going to continue things, people need to be covering their costs. We need to not be 
footing that all to the city because I have trouble saying we can't afford our deferred maintenance and to maintain our city, but we're going to foot the bill for the farmer's market. I, I have a hard time with that one. At any rate, whatever we're going to decide, I feel like it needs to be a policy decision. What are we going to do around that bell tower area? Is it going to be all the way down the alley? Is it going to be just around the bell tower? Is it not going to be at all? Because what's going to happen going forward is we're going to have other people who are going to ask about that venue. And they're going to say, hey, wait, but I'm a nonprofit. Well, let me tell you, we have over 300 nonprofits in El Dorado County. And how are we going to decide who we close it for, who we don't close it for, how often we're going to do that, and, and balance those positive and negatives that we're dealing with right now, that we're going to hurt certain merchants. I mean, I understand merchants who are not close to that area are not really affected, but the merchants, <coughs> merchants who are right there are, are deeply affected. So there's a lot to consider, and that's how I'm going to start that off. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other comments at this point? Well, I guess I'll dive into that. Um, this is, yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I, I do, I, <laughs> I, I do, I do have some difficulty with this notion that there are people selling things that you can go into the stores and buy. You know, I mean, there is a direct competition here. Now, th that isn't the end all and be all. That doesn't necessarily make it a deal killer, but I, I do struggle with that. And access and egress into businesses is important. And I've heard, you know, I, I, I'm surprised. I, I talked to a lot of people about, you know, in our sojourn for the one survey, there was also some questions about this other thing. And then I've just known enough people on Main Street. I talked to them. I'm surprised more people did not respond, but that's a different issue. We got the responses we got, and I'm not going to argue with them. Um, I did notice one thing about the responses, though, and except for one merchant, People that are very close proximate to this thing generally don't like it very much. And then they can po point to specific things that they don't like about it. Parking, the bathrooms, there's these issues, access, egress. The ones that tend to be more in favor of it tend to be a little further away. And their responses were more along the lines of, well, if you bring people into town, that's a good thing. That, and that's a good, that's a reasonable comment. There's nothing, no, I wouldn't argue with that comment either. But it does beg the question, and I've talked about this when it comes to a lot of events and a lot of things about Placerville and a lot of things about the historic downtown. I can remember a time, because I've lived here long enough, when nobody went downtown. The downtown was dead. And you had to do things to bring people downtown. That's when a lot of the things like the fairs and stuff came up where they would close Main Street and they would have an event because you had to focus people on coming back downtown because there had been this transition in the businesses. I can remember when there wasn't all those stores that were downtown, the home store, Ben Franklin, all those places that were downtown, and they all went out of business, and slowly other businesses moved into them. But you had to promote that, and that was, I think, an important thing. I go downtown almost every, not every day, but almost every day. And the one thing that I always am amazed by is how many people there are downtown. Now, some of those people are shopping. Some of those people are working. But the idea that you have to focus this notion on, well, if it brings people downtown, that's it. It's bringing people downtown. I suggest people go downtown anyway, and I think maybe what you are only doing is you're substituting one group of people that go downtown for another group of people that go downtown because they're going to the farmer's market, and it eliminates folks. I mean, I'm not a shrinking violet, and I can drive, but, you know, th there's lots of times on Wednesday I just go, yeah, I don't want to go downtown. I won't go downtown that afternoon because I just don't want to. Um, and I think that... That's a bigger discussion about Main Street and bringing people downtown and why you do it and it, the benefits or detriments of it. Um, I don't like that it has crept down the alley. I don't, you know, I, I, I come by every, I come through there sometimes and I go, when I do go downtown, and I go, oh, now it's there and now it's there and now it's there. And then when I see what they're selling, I'm going, well, that's not a fruit or a vegetable. I don't understand that. Um, those are my personal beliefs. People can argue with me about that. Um, I think there should be a ratio of farmer's stuff 
to when you're on public land. Now, what the other thing too is this is public land. This is not somebody's private property. I don't own that st street. The people, the residents of Placerville, own that. All the streets here in town. And so, what we do with that public land is important. Um, I think there should be a percentage. I think that it should be weighed heavily on the fruits and vegetables and less on the stuff because I can go downtown and buy that stuff all the time or anywhere else for that matter. Um, um, I think that if you make the farmer's market bigger, you should pay more. I know that there's a 503 fill in the blank and all that stuff, but the fact of the matter is, is that we are, you know, every one of those vendors now puts money in some, that, that group and it's costing other people money. And anyway, um, those are my thoughts, such as they are. Thank you. Um, Council Member Cutberg. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, I mean, I think having the farmer's market at the Bell Tower is, is very nice for a lot of our residents, particularly ones that may work um, downtown on Main Street. It gives them a nice opportunity to pick up their fruits and vegetables, you know, on their way home from work which I think is sort of a great resource and a, and a really nice location from that standpoint. Um, I'm concerned about the cost to the city. I think, you know, we really shouldn't be subsidizing events on public property, uh, particularly if they're competing with our um, brick and mortar stores. So, I mean, I certainly would be open to limitations to agriculture and farms um, and not allowing as much of the you know, goods purchases that are not agricultural. Um, the Ivy lot, I think, would be, in my mind, not really a viable option because, according to the folks here, it would take them five to six years to reestablish at a new location. And I think we know that probably within five to six years, we'll have some sort of construction project oh, yeah. that will be closing that lot. So I would not want to relocate somebody to some place and then to relocate them again. I just think that's not fair to them and fair to their um, their business. So those are kind of my initial thoughts. Um, I do know the trail wasn't great for the previous farmer's market business. I like the trail. I had lots of fun going to the trail. <laughs> I love the trail farmer's market. I would go <laughs> personally. I love, I love the trail. Um, but I guess it's, can that be viable? I, I would love it to be. I would really love it to be if we could get our residents to go down to the trail on Wednesday night and have a great thriving farmer's market there. Um, but, you know, I do have concerns that that wasn't super successful in the past and probably a busier time a Saturday morning on the trail than a Wednesday night would be. All right. Thank you, Nicole. I just want to make one comment about that Saturday market. When it moved, there was almost no advertising at all. And so, you know, when you're going to move something, it does take effort. And we can't just say, oh, it didn't work because, you know, just because. It's because we didn't put any effort into it and no one else put any effort into it. I mean, look at 24 Carat up on Jakeway. They do a great business and they're out of the way. So I don't know if I entirely agree with that this Saturday this just didn't work. I'm sure if Casey King set up a his mobile uh, unit up on, on the back there, there'd be tons of people waiting to go get a burger from Casey. So this is true. Okay. Let me see if I can jump in here a little bit. Um, well, first thing I like to point out is we had three farmers markets. We're down to one. I'd hate to see them disappear altogether. We still have three. They're just not on public land <laughs> well i'm talking about downtown oh, okay. oh so okay. i mean they're gone i mean i know and i my wife and i we enjoyed the saturday market when it was in the ivy lot when it was on the farm trail i mean it was unfortunate that it moved to where it moved because we find ourselves going there less we find ourselves going more to the wednesday night market so because we enjoy that and of course we are fortunate we can walk to downtown so you know we're kind of out of the ordinary with that um I do have concerns with, um, you know, the expansion and, of course, the cost to the city. I do need to be, think we need to take a look at that. Not necessarily is that a deal breaker, but we should actually be taking a look at that because we are trying to keep, you know, downtown, our downtown. One of those things is, you know, the Wednesday night market, the events that we have downtown. Those things bring people downtown. Regardless if it's causing issues or not, they still bring people downtown. Those people spend money. They spend money in all of the, you know, frontages that we have. 
Um, I do think that we definitely need to take a look at the percentage of farmers, you know, goods compared to crafts and food vendors and whatnot, because that is direct competition with our, uh, you know, vendors that are, you know, our, our merchants that are downtown, and, you know, we need to support them. Um, when it comes to the expansion and the alleyway, I think we kind of need to take a look at that from a safety standpoint. Um, not just necessarily is could they be driving into the farmer's market, but emergency access for, you know, city responders and all that kind of stuff. So I think we got a lot of questions that we need to answer, and we, I think we really need to direct some of these questions back to staff and get some more answers and go from there. Thank, thank you. Um, my thoughts, I mean, my first thoughts are my, my first and number one priority are to our brick and mortar stores that are on Main Street. Just bottom line is that they're always going to be my first, um, the, the thing I think about first are, are those folks um, that are on, on the street. Everything else is sort of gravy after that, events, things downtown. Uh, but the reality is that everyone that's around this item is, you know, council members have said, is they don't like it, the, the folks that are directly in front of it. It's just like, I'm sure, you know, if you have something in front of your own house, you might not like it, but if it was 100 feet down the way, you know, and it was something you wanted to go to, it might be great. Uh, and I think this is the same thing that's happening here on Main Street. If you're a business that is directly in front of this, they can't see your, people can't see your business, it's every week uh, for a good part of the year, um, you know, that's a problem. So I think... I know it didn't intend to start that way. Uh, I think, like everything, there's always the best intentions, correct? You know, we want to do something, and I didn't even realize that the city first initiated the uh, <coughs> idea of doing a downtown farmer's market. Um, but like everything, things change, times change, um, and, and, and so we have what we have today, which is a larger uh, footprint than what we originally did. So I have concerns with that. Uh, I have concerns um, with, I mean, I'll say, I mean, drive by there Wednesday nights. And it's true. You do have to be extra careful. I mean, you always have to be careful on Main Street about someone darting out in the middle of the street and taking a picture or running across the street. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the pedestrian areas are not always adhered to. So, uh, but even more so when you have folks that are basically, when the street's open and you have folks right up about you know, you're abutting the, the traffic with, uh, you know, with the vendors. So it, it, it is a little trickier. And you do have public safety issues when it comes to closing the alley down. And, I mean, these are all the conversations we had over a lot larger items as well, right, from uh, Trip to Green, uh, I mean, from a lot of different things. It was like, how much do we want to close down Main Street when we do have public safety concerns, when we do have fire season, when we have the ability to move fire and police through? So all these things sort of get melded together as, as we go forward. Um, you know, I would be open to something that's a smaller footprint. My guess, though, would be that the larger it is, the more um, it might not make sense from a, from a dollar perspective for farm trails to run something that's only, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables because it probably doesn't pay for the, the actual thing to keep going. So I, that I don't know. Uh, so if we put those limits on it, it may kill it just by the fact that you need those extra people in order to make it successful. I, I'm not sure on that. We'd have to, you know, ask that question. But I would be open to that shrinkage, too, if we had... Um, if we had, uh, you know, access to the to the alley still as it when it first opened, and people could still make the right turn, you know, off of uh, stagecoach when it first happened. Uh, I agree about, you know, you don't want to move somebody twice. I think that's bad. Um, and, and but I do think, you know, the trail makes a lot of sense uh, if we can make it work. And again, it's marketing. It's you know how much effort can be put into that marketing to see if it can be successful. And if People, like I know if I have my favorite places, I'm still going to go if they go somewhere as long as I can get to them. Um, you know, I think that's, that's, a, that's still going to be somewhere where someone will go, but it, is, it will take some marketing to do. So those are my thoughts to begin to start off with. John? Well, you know, and it does beg the question because, say, for one of the options on here was the Fox lot. Now, that presents its own problems. <laughs> so I'm just, but I'm just saying, you know, so if you took all of this, and you moved it to the Fox lot. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I don't run a farmers market. I don't know what the dynamics of it. I don't know what the 
brand loyalty of these things are. I don't know any of that. But it seems to me I mean, you're basically moving at several hundred yards from one part of Main Street down to another part of Main Street. The Ivy House is parking lot's a little bit further away. We, in, it's funny in Plasterville, we make all these things sound like they're like miles and miles, but it's such a small footprint. If you were in any other city, large city, it would be you wouldn't even be thinking twice about it. Say, well, you can move over there, and over there would be fine. Um, I don't say that cavalierly, but on the other hand, um, and would we still have the same concerns? Now we wouldn't have the concerns about they're blocking my building, they're in front of me, they're blowing the circulation up in the in the um, in the parking lot, um, and there would almost certainly be other kinds of concerns. Um, but I'm, you know, I mean, we don't even know what the vendor is willing to actually contemplate doing. This is true. I mean, well, yeah, and I think yeah. you're moving it to the other lot, then you have those businesses oh, yeah. that well, are next have, to there. Well, the bank won't be such a the problem because they I mean, close at four true. or whatever. But Jose's going to be all over you because the tap yeah, house the tap uses house that and, as a parking know, The giant lot. sinkhole that they now have in what used to be their parking lot. Well, that's tr that wasn't a sinkhole. That was a bridge that fell apart. <laughs> yeah. But that's a different animal. <laughs> it's anyway. still a big giant hole. It's a big yes. hole. No, no, you're right. And so that's why I said I don't take these things and just say them because, you know, there's a, there's a challenge about moving it around. Honestly, the Ivy House parking lot, from my perspective, would be the better one. But you're right; if we're going to be moving in there, yeah. Yeah, if 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 there is a Clay Street project, we yes. really don't want to predetermine that now, do we? Um, if there's a Clay Street project, but you know, it, it it is on the horizon. So, yeah. So another another thought I had, which isn't on our options because it's not an option for 2023, but might be a long term option, would be the mosquito lot that should be completed this year and I could see where that would be a really great location in terms of it's right off of the you know highway entrance it's right by the trail it's where people get off the bus who are coming back from you know work that take the bus down the hill well, yeah. and there's plenty of parking as well as space for a market there but you know it's not an option this year but my understanding is that it would be by next year so I guess that would put us in the situation of leave it at the bell tower one more year which i know you guys had that conversation before and <laughs> was like this is the last year <laughs> um but that was one thing i was thinking of right. rebecca can you tell us when that parking lot will be done it starts construction tentatively right now weather dependent march 13th it takes about three months to build so end of june ish who, who owns the transfer station we own the lot yeah okay yeah, and I think, and we've had, and thank you for bringing that up, because I know we've, previous discussions, that, that had come up as an alternative site for, I think, a couple of different things. Uh, maybe it was even in this discussion uh, last year. Um, so that is an option, a uh, future option, but a, an option nonetheless, um, you know, to, to consider uh, would be that. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, I think you've all have heard the discussion that's going on so far. Um, if you all don't mind, I, I wouldn't mind inviting back up to the podium uh, the the tr the our our uh, proponents uh, and seeing if you know if they have any thoughts from what you've heard so far. Because I, I would love, I hate to have us make a decision that won't stand up for two minutes after we're we're done gaveling down, anyways. Thank, thank you, Mike. Yeah, no problem. I'm Mike Owen again, uh, Farm Trails. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, address some of the things that have been raised. Um, the idea of having a specific percentage of vendors associated with ag, we're all over that. Uh, we would welcome that kind of thing. Why did it change at all? Why are we even having that discussion? We had one of the worst harvests that Eldorado County's ever had last year. And to base things on 2022 when many uh, grape farms or vineyards got no grapes and all the cherries were wiped out and Apple Hill was wiped out, uh, Apple Hill got a extraordinarily high percentage of their apples this year from Washington. I'm not trying to punish those guys. Um, agriculture is that. It's the, it's the uncertainty of that. It's the, right now, uh, Shauna pointed out when I sat down, these folks are planting right now for the season. And everyone, you know, in ag this time of year, it's raining like, uh, raining like crazy. Everything's dormant. It's going to be a good year. That's what keeps farmers going. Uh, you know, the other opportunities to, to move are certainly 
um, there. I appreciate the conversation about the mosquito lot. That's interesting to, to talk about. We still have the move issue. And, uh, you know, there's some ways to do it. If you don't have to place barriers, things get cheaper. So, um, you know, we're absolutely happy to be part of a discussion on this. Um, it didn't feel like there was a lot of um, lead up into discussion when we first got to here because when I had called Cleve and Terry, it's like, well, where are we with this? And how come it was never agenda? And how come this is the first we're hearing? And so that was didn't give us a lot of time to respond. Uh, one other element this year is I think there's a period of time that's required to get the state of California to toss a bunch of uh, paperwork together and approve a new space. And so that's not inconsequential just because we all have to deal with the regulations of the state. So thanks for letting me uh, talk again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Well, I'm just noodling through all the ideas and everything we're, we're talking about and the mosquito... Okay, okay, this is my idea, then I want to hear your idea. Okay, my idea is, okay, if we're, if we're talking about moving this to the Mosquito parking lot because that's a preferred location over the trail, fine. I'm fine with that. And we're only going to miss that mark by one month because if we started it in July, it would be finished and ready to go. What if we started it at the farmer's market in June, we has, and you do a lot of advertising throughout that whole month where we advertise, we're in July, we're moving here. In July, we're moving here. And you do a whole campaign to help that, that following. That was my thought. Um, I have two thoughts. One is, yes, it was a bad year for farmers last year, but the creep of this thing has been happening over years. That didn't all of a sudden happen just yesterday. And I don't, I mean, yes, there might have been more of it and there might have been a few less zucchinis out there, but but this this adding of, of the adding of the of the of the things has been going on now for years. That's been my observation. I one of the things and I you you got my memory back. Um, I thought about this. We tend to we have this focus on concrete or asphalt oriented locations. I don't know why. We well, no, stop. <laughs> You know, we have some perfectly good parks near the downtown, and would uh, would Benham Park be a place? I mean, it's very lovely there. There's grass. Okay, come on. I'm sorry, I just did your <laughs> that, job. That's that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll roll with when this. When you have food vendors, which all the farmers are, yeah, they have to have a, a washable location underneath them. So so they you can't, can't wash the grass. No, okay. because if they spill something, they can't. So that. As much as I love the park, I just want that's it's a it's a health thing. Got it. Understood. Thank Understood. you. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Which is well, kind of nuts, but <laughs> I I get it. I get you know, the it. Catholic the Church has a perfectly good parking lot across uh, the yes, street. Yes, please. <laughs> Can I ask a question on that, uh, that too? Because we moved the farmers market to the trail, which is not a hard surface. Right. It's a oh, gravel. Uh, it was it was a decomposed granite service, and yeah, maybe yeah. that works. Not really. The health department gave you gave them special privileges, but it's not. It, it has but they to be, they did they, get they, that they approval made, to move there. Tarps down. Yeah, but they weren't supposed. It's not legal to do that yeah. for the health for health code. Okay. They could. They. I mean. Okay. No, I don't Thank, I Thank you. Right well, I, I get. I mean, and I appreciate. Thank, thank you for the extra. I, I really appreciate the uh, the extra information and and the feedback because I think it's helpful as we're we don't always do the sort of the sausage making you know uh, up it's here, uh, but it's it's yes. <laughs> but I think from what I can see is there's there's a I don't I won't say consensus, but maybe a consensus to try to help save this thing. Maybe at a different location, maybe where it's at, but maybe needed to flesh out a little bit more because we probably probably needs to be a lot more details that has to be fleshed out with with the proponents or with with the trail association um, and whether or not it's even a workable solution, whether it's mosquito, whether it's where we're at or whether it's at the trail um, so I'd hate to make a premature um, take a premature uh, Yes. Position, decision, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if it's not in our best, and I don't know if we need to have a decision tonight. So I guess what I was, what I may be looking at is, do we send this back to staff? Um, yes. 
I, I know in our meeting with Mike, I know it was urgent that they need a decision so they know where they're going to be because they do marketing and et cetera. But maybe I could just ask if, if we delayed this until our next meeting on the 28th, is that acceptable to you? Okay. Okay. Just just want to make sure from what, what we would talk about. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Maybe we could do that. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, we can try to, from what it, I'm hearing there's at least maybe some consensus, I don't think complete, on uh, whether it be Mosquito or the or the um, uh, trail or, or the lot. Yeah. Or redo a footprint. Well, <laughs> yeah. Because we can try to narrow down um, the scope so that the discussion isn't sort of tabula rasa, but there's actually... Um, Here's here's your options. Do these work? Um, I don't know what you do. well, what you think. I mean, if you're gonna go with that option, I, I'm gonna go back to my comment about a policy decision in that area, and and how are we gonna mitigate the problems that the merchants are having in front of yep. there right now, and how are we gonna be fair to everyone in the community, and how are are they gonna be able to cover the costs of staying there? You know, I don't think that we should be covering those costs anymore. Um, I mean, I don't know. I well, think I think we have a consensus that we need to move it somewhere else. That's that's right. That's what I meant. I meant that the consensus was. I didn't say not a, maybe not a full consensus, but a consensus that the location. Now we're getting we're weaning ourselves off of public land to the extent possible, uh, and that includes the downtown footprint um, yeah. that actually closes off whether it's parking or ingress egress. Uh, and so the options that would be available would, wouldn't affect those things in the same way. So that'd be mosquito, and that'd be the trail. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. At least to. So, so are you asking to continue this item to the next meeting and give staff time to talk to the farm trails? Is that what you're looking for? With within the context of understanding the conversation that was had here. Uh, within the context of those two locations. So may I? If you don't mind, I'll just jump in here. I recommend a motion uh, directing staff to, again, uh, narrow the scope and come back with a, an item asking the same question for council deliberation. Thank you. Do I have a, a I'll I'll entertain a that motion? I'll make a motion to ask staff to revisit the two different locations and come back with a plan. Is that the two locations being Mosquito and, and the Mosquito or the trail? Yeah, and do we want to leave it a little open ended? Can we do that, lawyer? To say that if they were to come up with a open to third, miraculous other decisions third, that, yes. that, that address okay, all the we, issues we, brought up tonight, we don't have to have miraculous <laughs> decisions. That, that's, I mean. that's appropriate, okay. but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not this. Yeah, I, I don't know if we out. should necessarily narrow it down just to two locations, but at yeah. least come back with, you yeah. know, what kind of solutions that we can come up with that we can make a decision on. Well, that anybody's <laughs> guess. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because obviously there's going to be a lot of conversation here. And, you know, I mean, right. if, if honestly, if this, this market was actually started by the city, I think the city has a, a little bit of a due diligence here to, to do whatever we can to get this well. taken care of and, you know make sure that when they do move, if we're going to have to move them that fast, that at least, right. you know, we can get marketing out on our website or something like that. So it's not as such of an impact if we have to move it like we're doing. One thing that I would suggest and I'd like to discuss with the, the farm trails representatives is if that is the decision that we definitely want to move, which is what I'm hearing, is that we talk to them about a transition plan. And I think that's kind of what you're saying. Um, I, I know we want them you know, <laughs> moved as quickly as possible, but I think that we need to, to talk to them about marketing and transition plan, et cetera, of how that would happen uh, for them and, and keep them successful would be the goal, so. Okay. So does, is, um, does the motion still represent where we want to go with this? You're fine with it. Okay, I just want to make sure do we have it. We have a motion. We have a we have a motion on the table. Not a second yet. That's why I'm asking. Oh, I'll second. I'll that. Second, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have a first and a second. Do we have further discussion or any clarification from anybody? Can we just repeat the motion? Yes, that would be good. 
So that's for everyone to understand as well. You want me to remember that? Okay. I'll we make a motion to, to direct staff to explore other locations and a transition plan for the Wednesday night farmers market. Is that appropriate? Okay. All right. Everyone feel good about that? Going for it? Okay. All right. With that, then, uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Uh, comments. Uh, thank you. I know this is a long discussion, so I appreciate it. We'll take a five minute break. Thank you. All right. All right. I get to use that gavel every now and then. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get uh, started here. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. So we will move to item uh, 12.2. Uh, and that is to adopt a resolution, a one, approving an agreement with Sun Ridge Systems uh, for the purchase of a re the RIMS record management system, uh, and then two, authorizing the chief of police or its designee to execute the same order and any associated documentation for said purchase. And our chief has uh, this item for us. Thank you, chief. Ooh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening. And um, before I get started on my presentation, I just want to go ahead and... and uh, identify what RMS and CAD means. We reference it a lot in this report and, and not realizing that most people don't speak COP, so they don't, don't understand what it is. <clears throat> so our CAD system um, is a computer aid dispatch system that allows public safety operations and communications to be augmented, assisted, or partially controlled by an automated system. What that means is if somebody calls into dispatch and we have an E911 PSAP at, at the police department, um, a, a screen comes up and is self-populated, and as the information is provided to the dispatcher, that information gets sent in the system. When when names are, are, are provided, then it's cross-checked through the records management system. So it's it's a it's a component of the records management system. Now the record management system is the backbone where all information is compiled from CAD, report writing, evidence, your wanted persons, and so on. So. It's it's the it's the system that if we didn't have it, we would be writing on bark with charcoal. Uh, it, it really runs the police department. Um, Placerville Police Department uh, currently has a system known as TrackNet. Uh, the, the the TrackNet system had its limitations. Um, over the last several years, those limitations and challenges became more pronounced as they weren't upgrading their, their software technology. Uh, they weren't upgrading their technology to meet the requirements of our data sharing through RIPA or through NIBRS, the new UCR systems. Um, the Sheriff's Office was on TrackNet, so we made do because we liked the interoperability of accessing their systems and um, identifying uh, crime trends or uh, getting further intelligence on suspects. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, criminals pay no attention to jurisdictional lines. Um, last uh, year, I'm sorry, the year prior, uh, the Sheriff's Office um, floated out a, an RFP, RFQ for a new CAT RMS system, at which point they chose Sunridge Systems uh, RIMS program. Now that program, uh, so far, so it, it's like switching from a, a rotary phone to, a, to an iPhone. I mean, that's the difference between TrackNet and RIMS. Um, with us being on TrackNet still, we're the only organization that cannot communicate with any of our law enforcement partners in El Dorado County at this point. So essentially, we're on an island. El Dorado County Sheriff's, the DA's office, probation department, um, South Lake Tahoe, even the tribe has gone to, to RIMS. Uh, the RIMS system... Uh, once we make that transfer, will allow us to have that interoperability communication with not only everybody that wears a badge and gun in El Dorado County, but also regionally. And that's something that TrackNet didn't do for us. So all the system, all the all the uh, clients of RIMS right now, to include Folsom, all of Amador County uh, agencies within Sacramento, agencies within Placer County, we will have access to their data as they'll have access to ours as well for for. Um, um, uh, investigative purposes. With that, uh, I'm not technically I, I'm not technical when it comes to IT stuff. Uh, 
So I'm, I'm going to open for questions, but I want you to be very nice to me. <laughs> very, very no, I understood, Chief. And then I just wanted to make a note, and Dave, if you want to just jump in for a second. I mean, we, we talked about this in last year's budget. Uh, we programmed uh, okay. these funds, but you just wanted to touch on, on the dollars and cents real fast uh, for the public in terms of, of how, this, how this has been programmed so far. Sure. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So that's correct, as the mayor indicated, that you adopted a capital improvement program budget. And for this particular project, what we ended up doing is budgeting the estimated debt service on a five-year capital lease uh, for this project. And um, what we ended up doing, um, you took action, gave uh, the city manager direction to uh, enter into a master lease agreement with Bank of America. That included up to $750,000 of a, the initial draw of a $2 million open credit. <clears throat> that included this project. Um, what we ended up doing and talking to the chief, he indicated this is really a 10 to 20 year solution. So we ended up doing a 10 year lease, which cut the debt service in half. Mm -hmm. However, um, in further evaluating um, the project, it was, it was clear we need a new server and we need um, additional IT consulting services, which will be addressed in the strategy uh, item on the next on the next item on the agenda. So um, that's where the dollars come from. Understood. Thank you, Dave. I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that this had been programmed to the, to a degree, and uh, these aren't like new funds that we're done, now going to have to replace some other thing that we had had approved. So, thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and open up this item for public comment. Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. And I think we have a wonderful and great police department. But it's got to have interoperability with other people. You can't. If no man is an island, no city should be either. And for a critical piece of our city is our police department. So they have got to have interoperability with at least everybody else in El Dorado County. And as he said, since criminals do not care about what the jurisdictional lines are, you need to be able to reach out across the whole region. And for us not to have been able to do that is like, uh, so we put our police department in handcuffs and expect them to operate like that? I'm surprised we haven't done this already. So yeah, we need to do this. There's, there's no question we need to do this. Great. Thank you, Sue. If nothing else for emergency response. When you have wildfires going on, like we had last year with the Caldor fire, and our police department can't communicate, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, you really are back to bark and charcoal. <laughs> so let's get up to the real world here. Thanks, Sue. Any further comments on this item? I just had, I'm sorry, I had one more thing to add. Yep. Um, Sunridge is out of El Dorado Hills as well. So it's a local vendor that um, money stays local and our tech support, uh, if needed, is, is local. TrackNet is out of Santa Cruz, which is hard to get them to come this way sometimes. Great. Thank you, Chief. All right. Uh, so we close public comment. Uh, we'll bring it back to the council for further discussion or to or a motion. TrackNet sounds like one of those things that, like in the dystopian future, that was the TrackNet computers that took over everything. Sort of like, yeah. Anyway, I would like to make a motion to uh, uh, adopt staff option, the staff recommendation. I'll move staff recommendation to buy all this stuff. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank <second>. you. <laughs> Thank you both. All right. We have a first and a second. Any further comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Cleary T. Aye. Councilmember Gottberg. Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough. Aye. Vice Mayor No. Aye. Councilmember, excuse me, Mayor Saragossa. Aye. Thank you. Yes, that was Skynet. I think, I think it was Skynet. Yes. So then the Terminator came. Yes. Yeah, very similar. <laughs> All right. So we'll move to item 12.3, which is sort of a 12.2B. 
which is uh, adopt a resolution approving an agreement with Strati and supplemental for supplemental IT services and computer hardware for the police department uh, for the CAD and RIMS for an amount not to exceed eighty two thousand nine hundred twenty four dollars and eleven cents. And uh, Mr. Morris has uh, this item for us. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, following up on that item that we just completed, as we reviewed and looked at uh, the implementation of that new software, uh, we figured out that uh, we were going to need some help in uh, installing, implementing, et cetera, uh, what we were purchasing. Uh, I, I'm going to look at Joe. I don't remember the exact number, but I, I think the police department has something, or the sheriff's office has something like 12 people for like six months that put their plan together, put their process to implement their software for them. And we recognize that we don't have the staffing. Plus, there's some te technical uh, intricacies to this software that, that we needed some assistance with. So um, a few months ago, we, we went out on an RFP to request uh, the service to uh, help us with that process. And we also looked at a couple of other things that we've been looking at for some time that we had concerns with. And we asked for a proposal to address all of those issues. And uh, you can see that within this, uh, this write-up. There's two, two things related to this, which is the RIMS project and the CLETS project. Uh, the net motion upgrade is another piece that's related to that. That's for their, basically their, their laptops in their cars, correct, Joe, that, uh, that keeps those running and communicating with, uh, with dispatch and et cetera. The two other projects that we added to this were a backup and disaster recovery solution. Uh, basically, right now, as, as noted in the report, we have a backup system. Um, I will say it's not the best. Uh, we back up on a nightly basis uh, in terms of what, what changed during the day, and then on the weekends we do a full backup. But that's a tape backup, and um, it's, it's kept at City Hall. So if, there was, if City Hall was destroyed for some reason, uh, we, we could lose that. Um, so we've looked at other options, um, and if you, uh, w again, this is another one of those trying to come up to the, the, the next century and, and be our technology where it should be. Uh, look, this would actually um, do a backup in, in the cloud, um, and, and that provides, I think, two different options also that uh, if one went down, the other one still backs that up. So it's a much more secure system that would help us in terms of uh, a disaster recovery or if some other thing happened that was to uh, destroy our data that we have and our information that we have. So that one is extremely important to us. Uh, and the last one is a network mapping system. Currently, um, we, we sort of have that. If you were to talk to our IT guy, he would say, yeah, I, I kind of know where everything is and where it goes and what, what it's done, but we really don't. And so this is kind of a backup and disaster recovery part also in that if our IT person was not there and was not able to respond, um, we would not have good information to tell someone else how to come in and, and take care of that. So the purpose of the network mapping is to uh, define that, where all our servers are, where they go, how they link up, et cetera, and, and so that someone else coming in could look at that and say, okay, this is what I've got to fix. This is what I've got to take care of. So um, the cost for these, you can see in the report, uh, for the RIMS project that was just described, which I'm going to combine RIMS and CLETS together, 33,159.11. For the CLETS project, 22,800. So those, <clears throat> those are budgeted within the lease uh, that Mr. Warren just talked about. So those are, not, those are all f already funded and were budgeted at the beginning of the year. The other three items, the net motion upgrade of 6840, uh, the backup and disaster recovery solution of 7600, and the network mapping of $12,525 were not specifically budgeted. However, we did budget $40,000 for miscellaneous um, contract computer services. And that falls well within that cost um, to be able to pay for that service for this year. These that I've just described are one-time costs, so they'll only occur this year. However, for the, the backup and disaster recovery, there is an ongoing cost of $2,185 per month. So if you multiply that by 
12 months, you can see we're, um, it's a fairly significant cost, $28,120 a year. But we do feel that it's extremely important. This is where we are lacking, and it's something we need to have with our computer system to make sure that we are backed up and, and can recover <coughs> from any disaster that may happen. Also, for the network mapping, there's a, there's a subscription to a program that will help us update and keep this going. Uh, but that is only uh, $27.50 a month, so not a big deal there. But we do have those two ongoing costs that should we – uh, should you approve this tonight and move forward with, we'd have to recognize that we will have those costs we'll need to budget for in future years. In terms of the ongoing cost for year one, the 2185 a month and the 2750 a month, uh, those costs will also fill, uh, fall within that $40,000 budget that we budgeted for computer services. So essentially, uh, everything for this current year will co be covered in our current budget and will not requ require any additional um, allocation of funding for this current year. But we will have to recognize that in the, the coming year budget. I want to recognize and introduce you to Brent Largent from Strati, who is here in our audience tonight, he came up to answer any questions because uh, just as Chief Wren said he's not a, a technical guy. I'm not a technical guy any, either, so if you have any questions, Brent is here to answer those questions uh, regarding uh, the systems that, that we're, we're talking about. Um, with that, our, our recommendation is that you adopt the re resolution approving this agreement with Strati for uh, these five services that we have outlined tonight. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Cleve. And yeah, always kind of throws me when I know we have a tape backup. It's very DMV le legacy of us to have <laughs> that type of system still. And of course, theirs is still going. God knows when that system will all be done. But we're going in a different direction. All right. Any, any comments or questions? No. Obviously, this is something that needs to be done. I do have a question, though, not about this. I wouldn't even know what to ask. Um, when will the policey stuff be online? If we say yes. Well, we already said yes to that. If we say yes to everything. You mean the, the data that the public yeah, can yeah. When, when will As soon as the modules. Well, that's probably him. He could probably answer that. Whenever the system gets going. You know, he came from Chico. Did you come from yeah. Chico? Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, come up and answer a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I no, you're, doing, you're good. I you're good. your job. It, it referencing the module that allows the public to have access for calls for service and so prior calls. That'll all fall under the... Um, under the software once it gets installed, and a lot of that is going to be Sunridge's schedule and where we can get you on there. We should have everything prepped um, prior to that, but the last I saw um, talking to them on where they're at in installations, it's probably going to be the April-May time frame. Oh, okay. Awesome. okay. And, Brett, anything else you want? Since you're up, anything, anything else you'd like to add? So, And thank you for being with us tonight. Absolutely. You're absolutely right in that Tapes make me extremely nervous in that talk yes. about an outdated and difficult testing solution. Um, we implemented this exact same um, data solution for Paradise Police Department. And he does mention that it's cloud, but it's also actually a secondary server on premise so that if any hardware to fail, we could immediately switch over to, um, to that additional hardware to be able to keep the police station running. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, one quick question. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to let you get walked away there. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming this is all going to be backed up to the cloud. It is both backed up um, locally, in fact, every two hours on premise, and then nightly to the cloud. Okay, and then obviously we're going to have some sort of measure in place for hackability. Yes, it is what they call a mutable backup, where even if you had all the passwords to the information, you still couldn't get to it. Um, it is fully encrypted. Um, and both in transmission as well as um, at the local and the remote sites. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, Brett? I think. Oh yeah, no, that's a good question. Although I think that I, I think that was the last thing that was said just before Skynet took over the planet. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and continue with public comment on item 12.3. All right. All right, seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead. We got the good uh, fist, of, <laughs> fist, fist of approval, so I'll, I'll take that. 
Uh, we'll go ahead and close public comment, uh, bring it back to the council for further discussion or motion. Um, I'll move to adopt the resolution in accordance with the staff report. I'll second. All right, thank you both. Uh, we have a first and second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. All right, thank you. And we are all looking forward to seeing this come online. So thank you, uh, Chief Cleve, Brent. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing this, this stuff live. So yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on now to item 12.4. Uh, this is to adopt a resolution approving a banner reservation fee of $200 for the reservation and placement of promotional banners across Main Street effective February 15th of 2023. And Terry has this item for us. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, if, if you're not aware, the banners you see across Main Street hung from Old City Hall um, are managed by community services and also have a policy and a fee approved for organizations so they can advertise their events. Um, what we currently have right now is a $150 banner reservation fee, which was raised last year from $125. And um, that is intended to just cover the costs associated with providing the service. Um, and currently the entire fee does go to EcoSigns, who is our uh, vendor that does that work and hangs the signs and takes down the other ones on a weekly basis. Um, we do have some occasional repair of the overhead hangers and that's absorbed through our department budget. Uh, the banners used to be hung by our park division staff when we had a, a balcony as pictured in the photograph in the back of the room. Um, but that balcony fell and it was deemed that it was no longer safe to, for staff to access the police system. So we've been using EcoSign's um, lift truck from that point on. And so in May 1st of 2022, it, uh, the fee was increased. Um, EcoSigns contacted me and let me know that they had to raise their fee another $50 this year to cover their costs due to inflation in the labor market. And I think it's important for especially the public to know that at this rate, EcoSigns is still providing the city a deep discount. Um, normally, if they were to send out their truck for uh, a call uh, with their labor and their equipment and their fuel charge, it would be $365 to hire them to do this. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody realized that um, they are still doing a service and they are very happy to be in a relationship with the city and um, not really looking for profit uh, margin on this, just uh, covering their costs when they get started on a Monday morning. Um, so given the additional cost associated with uh, employing this eco signs, um, our $150 no longer co covers the cost. So we're in essence asking um, to get the council to approve the $200 fee, which we would start um, tomorrow for any new um, banners that were, um, that were uh, paid for uh, through this fee. So it looks like uh, we've got... Um, 12 banners already reserved because we do allow a six month window uh, for that. And so the additional cost to hang those is $550. Uh, and we anticipate this cost will be absorbed within our budget also. So um, I can, with that, I can answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zeller. Uh, any questions at this point? No. All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and open up this item for public comment. Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and close public comment, bring it back uh, to the council for discussion. I remember a time when Dave Brazelton used to do this stuff for free. Uh, and I guess that those days are long gone. Um, yeah, obviously, if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. Uh, I was actually, I remember the day that the balcony started to fall off the front of City Hall. We all went up and watched, and it was just like coming apart. Anyway, it was weird. I will move the staff recommendation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Clarici. I'll second. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, any further comments on this item? All right. Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. All right. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Moving on to item 12.5. 
uh, adopt a resolution, one, to direct staff to proceed with the deprogramming of funding uh, through the Highway Safety Improvement Program uh, and to terminate the Spring Street and Pleasant Street intersection safety project, and two, approving a $19,000 budget liquidation of the HSIP revenues for said project. And Rebecca has this item for us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The item before you is unlike one that we usually bring to Council. Staff is often adding projects to the CIP list based on needs and findings. However, the item before you this evening proposes to deprogram a previously approved project also based on needs and findings. The Spring Street and Pleasant Street intersection safety project was adopted by City Council at its regularly scheduled meeting held on March 26, 2019, when the City received federal funds from the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP for short. The City had long received safety concerns regarding the need for a pedestrian crossing at the intersection of Spring Street and Pleasant Street, where a parking lot is located on the south side of the intersection. The City was authorized to proceed with preliminary engineering with an approved uh, budget appropriation in the amount of $19,000. In 2020 and 2021, staff explored further into the history of the existing parking lot, its use, and the potential implementation of the federally funded project. The existing parking lot is a privately owned lot that serves a private parcel, which is known as the Shakespeare Club. Staff also discovered that the existing parking lot had been in existence for some time and had not been vetted through a plan review process, but rather the parking lot itself predated our review process to begin with. During the review, staff also determined that the implementation of safety measures consisting of a signed and striped crosswalk would still not adequately address the concerns and may not be the best use of public funds. The biggest challenge is that the sidewalk placed at the intersection would lack adequate stop, stopping site distance. The posted speed on uh, Spring Street is 30 miles an hour, which translates to roughly a stopping site distance of approximately 250 feet. Eastbound traffic does not have sufficient distance to react and safely stop their vehicle for a pr crossing pedestrian. Not only is the distance too short, but the hill and the roadside embankment coupled with the curve and the grade of the road visually impedes the intersection until the vehicle is approximately 100 feet away. Because of this visual restriction, even with the proposed signage and safety features, there would be a false sense of security for the crossing pedestrians. Based on these visual and geometric site restrictions, staff does not feel this is the best location for a crosswalk and under normal circumstances wouldn't install a crosswalk in these conditions if this was a proposed uh, parking lot. For these reasons, staff does not feel comfortable moving forward with the project due to safety concerns and is unable to justify the use of federal public funds solely for the private benefit as it conflicts with the funding requirements and the guidelines. These concerns were raised and discussed in full with the Shakespeare Club Board at their regularly scheduled meeting held on December 5, 2022, with then-Councilwoman Borelli present. The Board understood the restrictions and supported the City's decision to cancel the project. Of the $19,000 appropriated, $405.99 has been invoiced to Caltrans and would need to be reimbursed. Staff recommends Council to approve a $19,000 budget liquidation of the HSIP revenues for the said project. That concludes my verbal report, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions on this? Uh, yeah. I mean, I will say it's a bummer. I remember this project. Uh, it was like one of my first ones when I first uh, was appointed to city council. Um, I think it might have been my second meeting. Um, so I, I st it stuck out in my mind just because um, I know we were going to, we knew that the, you know, redoing of, of spring was going to happen and this would be potentially another traffic calming measure on that street. But I think with, you know, the way we did the lanes and some other things that were done, you know, some of that stuff's already happened. And so while this would have been great, I certainly understand uh, we don't want to, you know, have a false sense of security uh, on this street by having that, and there is that blind spot as you as you go over the hill. So, completely understandable. All right, um, we'll go ahead and open up twelve point five for any public comment. Sue Rodman. I'm president of Placerville, and I definitely support this because when I'm going to cross the street, I look for a crosswalk. And if there is a crosswalk there, I have an expectation of being able to cross the street safely. Yeah. And when that's not true, 
there should not be a crosswalk. If you're going to cross the street and there's no crosswalk, you look very carefully and you run. <laughs> and especially when you know that people cannot see you and you've got a blind hill and a curve and you say, yeah, this is pretty dicey. So just the fact that they have a parking lot with no real pedestrian access across the street is not a great idea in the first place, but no, we shouldn't put a crosswalk there because you do have an expectation of safety. If there's a crosswalk there, I expect to, to cross safely. It's the same issue as I brought up with the bollards, you know. I expect there to be a safe crossing, and when there is no light and you can't see pedestrians, uh, and there's no light there at the, this proposed crossing, you know, you, you just know it shouldn't be there. So, good decision. Good research by our engineers. Thank you, Sue. And, and, and you are right. I mean, you pretty much look left and right, and you make a dash for it yes. at that location. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, any other public comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and bring it back to City Council. All right, any further discussion on this item, or I'll entertain a motion. Um, I will move that we make our resolution in accordance with the staff report. All right, thank you, Council Member Gottberg. I'll second that. All right, thank you, John. All right, uh, seeing no further comments, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Cleary Chief. Aye. Councilmember Gottberg. Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough. Aye. Vice Mayor No. Aye. Mayor Zaragoza. Aye. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, moving to item 13, which are our council reports from other agency meetings. Uh, and the first one, uh, Transit Authority. Yes. Uh, action items, we adopted the 22-23 mid-year operating budget adjustments. We authorized a local short-range transit uh, plan update. And one fun thing is we approved a student bus art contest at the schools. So the kids will all do their designs and one will be picked and then it will be put on one of the buses and they'll see all their art driving around town. Part of the promotional yeah, thing. So, cool. yeah. Nice. Very cool. Okay, and uh, one other thing that uh, Vice Mayor No did not uh, announce that uh, we congratulate her on being the chair for Transit Authority. For All right, New very cool. Too. Thank you. Awesome. All right, uh, Transportation Commission. All right. Oh. Okay. I have to go back to my notes here. All right. Um, yeah, you, uh, you, I was. Uh, I will. I was made the chair. Yeah. Uh, but yay. Uh, funny part of history, I was the vice chair the year I did not get voted back onto the council. So this is sort of like just an extension. It was like those four years didn't ever happen. Okay. Um, we uh, adjusted our – the executive director, Woodrow's uh, compensation. He deserves it. Uh, he does a great job. He has tremendous reputation in uh, transportation throughout the state, actually. He's, it's a, he's quite something. Uh, we did an update of our OWP. That's inside baseball stuff. Um, Mr. Sir, Mayor Saragossa was uh, named. He volunteered to be the California Association of Councils of Governments uh, representative. Yeah, by accident. No, but. you didn't. It wasn't accidental. <laughs> but nonetheless, yes. But yes, you did. Um, we we voted with apparently a lot of other people to uh, discontinue our relationship with uh, with the church and. Um, uh, there are our, our, our lobbyists in in DC had a have had a long relationship with those folks, David, and uh, but uh, since our congressman doesn't believe in earmarks, there's really no reason to have anybody advocating for you. Um, so that was kind of a sad thing. Uh, and then we got a really overly long, terribly overly detailed report about something that really doesn't have anything to do with the city. It's a study that's being done about the safety at um, the Highway 49 Forest Hill Road uh, intersection, uh, a.k.a. the confluence of the Middle Forks and the North Fork of the American River. Anybody that's been down there any weekend during the summer, it places a zoo. It's very dangerous. Um, they're looking at all sorts of things to help alleviate that issue. But um, the, we got a um, presentation from the consultant that was um, excruciating. 
<laughs> it was very, long. It, it was, was like very 48 it was, slides. It was 40, 44 slides. 44, 44 slides. slides. The notes never, ever, ever do a 44 slide. Never. Six slides. That's what you should do it in. Okay. Um, anyway, that's it for that. All right. Uh, SACOG, uh, nothing really. Uh, we went over budget, uh, sort of uh, budget for next year, and then we had introduction of our new state lobbyist team. Uh, so we went through some legislation, uh, the fact there might be some uh, committee chair changes uh, with the new legislature this year. Um, oh, did I just, okay. I'll, I'll, I will come back. Uh, I read right over LAFCO. Uh, and I'm trying to think of anything else that popped up. Um, the, only, the only other thing we've had this, and I brought this up before, we had the discussion about uh, ensuring that El Dorado County is still going to have sort of a seat at the table when it comes to certain federal funding that's now uh, have to, that they're mandating now to have to go through SACOG. That money used to come into EDCTC. And so all signs point to hopefully the, the federal highway yeah. uh, being uh, accepting our plan as well as a lot of plans from across <coughs> California. So yeah. uh, cautiously optimistic there. And we'll, we should have more information, I think, by next month. So I will uh, update on that item. And now I will go back to LAFCO. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, LAFCO, um, the only thing that was really important about LAFCO was that I was put, I volunteered and was put on the, a subcommittee, and I forget all the acronyms and forgive me, I didn't write it down. Uh, basically, it's the subcommittee that's going to be looking at all of the zones of uh, influence, spheres of influence, uh, potential um, annexation locations, that sort of thing, boundary line adjustments around the city, because uh, they're doing their, I think they do them every five years, four or five years, they do updates to those things, and I definitely wanted to be on that. So I was put on that um, on that subcommittee, and um, then I went and visited with staff, uh, with uh, Mr. Rivas, to make sure that we are all on the same page on exactly what we want to be promoting uh, for those locations around the city that we want to include, maybe potentially expanding the sphere of influence, potentially looking at uh, put, including them in areas that will be annexed, um, and these other things. So uh, that's really important. It's one of the only reasons I'd want to be on LAFCO. So, um, so anyway, that is your LAFCO update. Thank you very much. Uh, Pioneer. Yeah, so um, uh, last week I was sworn in for Pioneer Energy Community Board of Directors, and uh, other than that, nothing to report because we meet on Thursday. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, Fire Safe Council. They are still planning their March 18th events, which will be from 9 to 3 down at Midtown Mall. They have a lot of fun events, new stuff this year, so everybody should put that on their calendar. Fun stuff coming up. Very cool. Uh, two by two committee. Uh, we have not met, but we are. Uh, we do have a meeting uh, upcoming this month, later this month. So uh, more to more to report on that at our next city council meeting. And um, I think we have one more. Yeah. Uh, Opportunity knocks. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, we talked about the uh, process for applying for emergency solutions grants, and then our meeting was on February 5th, so the majority of it was uh, dedicated to an update on the Navigation Center, which opened on February 7th. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, and I will go ahead and open up uh, item 13 for any public comments. Admin Fire Safe Council Board, um, there will be a table at this event for the city, for our city staff, mm -hmm. and we are hoping that a lot of the council members will come at least attend part of the time. And uh, so, but that will give an opportunity for the city to be able to present to the public the benefit of having city with our staff thank you sue any other comments on item 13 yep. all right seeing none uh, we'll go ahead and
thank you everybody for uh, the reports. And we'll move to item 14, uh, requests for future agenda items. Any, any requests this meeting? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll move to item 15, uh, city manager and staff reports, uh, 15.1. Uh, which is our police report and uh, chief anything you want to highlight uh, last month the first part of the month we were pretty busy with emergency response related to the um, uh, storms so that took up a lot of our time uh, crime continues to be pretty flat while areas around us are suffering uh, extreme peaks of um, um, crimes ie the sacramento region so I attribute that to the relationship we have with the community and the fact that the community takes stewardship over their public safety and that we um, do everything we can to be a good partner for them and uh, be responsive to their needs. Um, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to 15.2. Uh, Chief Cordero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Within your packet, you'll see the uh, the monthly stats for Station 25, Engine Medic 25, and I might draw your attention to the back of the packet where I included the uh, total calls for uh, the calendar year of 2022. And you'll note our engine companies, we have five engine companies, and they ran a total of 8,077 calls. Of that, uh, Engine 25 accounts for just over 43% of our calls. So they, uh, they're a busy engine company. Uh, if you break it down, you know, they're, they're close to 10 calls a day. Yeah. When you look at our ambulances, and these are just the four ambulances that County Fire currently operates, um, those crews ran a total of 12,086 calls last year. So uh, Medic 25 and, and Medic 28, <clears throat> which is currently in Diamond Springs for us, you know, they were, they were both closing on 4,000 calls a year, which is pretty active. And uh, just a final note on that with the uh, upstaffing of Medic 49, which we've been keeping you abreast on, the six paramedics will be staffing that. They come on board on uh, next Tuesday, the 21st, to begin their orientation training. So probably sometime in uh, mid-March, we'll have Medic 49 stood back up and add that additional medic unit to the county. Uh, that's fantastic news. Thank you, Chief. That's great. Any, any questions, comments? All right. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and open up uh, item 15 for any public comments. All right, seeing none, uh, thank you again, Chiefs, uh, for the report. Uh, so we'll move to item 16, which are upcoming items, which I'll let people review uh, at their uh, leisure. Uh, so it is at 719. I will uh, adjourn tonight's meeting of the Plaza Royal City Council. Thank you, everybody. Not bad. Good evening. Not bad.